Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Elhamdülillahi Rabbil Alemin. Ve usalli ve usallim ala seyyir al-awwalin ve al-akhirin Nebiyyena Muhammeden ve ala alihi ve ashabih ve men da'a bi da'watihi ve stenna bi sunnati ila yevmiddin ve sellem teslimen kathira. Amma ba'd. All praises are due to Allah, Lord of the worlds, and peace and blessings be constantly showered upon our beloved Prophet Muhammad, the master of the first and the last, and upon his family, his companions, and all those who call to his way and establish his sunnah to the day of judgment. My beloved brothers and sisters, I begin with the greeting words of the righteous. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Alhamdulillah, it is again a great privilege for me to be with you here uh, in Trinidad. And uh, Alhamdulillah, for me, uh, coming to different sections of Trinidad and Tobago uh, is like a homecoming for me in this region. My grandmother, um, my mother's mother, migrated from Barbados in 1930 uh, to the United States and married an African American. Uh, my wife is Jamaican, and alhamdulillah, I lived in this region uh, for a number of years, uh, traveling around. And, and Trinidad is a special place. And I pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala um, would continue to bless you with institutions like this <clears throat> and would raise up another generation who can continue to hold on to the banner of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The times we are living in are unique times. They are strange times. Human beings have developed amazing abilities. We have the ability to heal, to save lives in a way like never before. But at the same time, with that technology, we also have destruction. We can kill and destroy more people more rapidly than any time in human history. We have the ability to communicate in an unbelievable way. And even within some of our lifetimes, to think that you could take a little box out of your pocket and talk to somebody in China uh, would be a strange thing. But now it is common amongst people. But with this communication, there's a downside. Because people can not only be educated simultaneously, but they can be confused simultaneously. And human beings can make what is right appear to be false. And make what is false appear to be right. And so it's a time when we need to have beneficial knowledge, ilmun nafia, when we need to keep direct communications with each other and not depend upon artificial intelligence. If you can take anything from me, don't depend upon artificial intelligence to structure your life. Because we may one day wake up and find that we're actually being controlled through a machine. And Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu did not speak from himself. He spoke with knowledge from above seven heavens. And an authentic hadith reported in by Imam al Suyuti and al Jami al Sagir, Abu Huraira radiallahu an, narrated that the Prophet said, Yakunu fi akhir al zaman dajjalun kadhabun. Ya'tunukum fil ahadith bima lam tasma'u antum wa la aba'ukum. The Prophet ﷺ said in authentic hadith that there will come near the end of time great liars, false prophets, and they will come to you with a type of speech that neither you nor your family has ever heard of before. Beware of them. Beware that they take you astray and beware that they put you into a fitna. And a fitna is trial, tribulation, gray area, confusion, and sadaqah Rasulullah alayhi salatu wasalam 
it has come to pass. Digital technology. Think about this. The Prophet Sallallahu is, is given revelation. He's a, living in Arabia 1400 years ago and, and he responds to what he is inspired to say. And he said to us, there's gonna be a type of speech neither you nor your family has ever heard of something like this before. And we have seen this in our lives. We have seen the change that people are going through. And that change is intensifying more and more as time goes by. Every day we open up the news and we hear about something else strange happening in different parts of the world. But when we get a report, we have to confirm the report. Because sometimes that report is actually twisted around and changed so we don't even know if it's the truth or if it's falsehood. And the Prophet ﷺ spoke about these times that we are living in. And we can see it as we move toward the day of resurrection. The Prophet ﷺ said in authentic hadith narrated by Abu Huraira radiallahu anh, Sayati ala nasi sanawatun khadda'at. Yusaddiqu fiha al-kathib, wa yukadhibu fiha al-sadiq, wa yu'temanu fiha al-kha'in, wa yukhawinu fiha al-ameen, wa yantiqu fiha al-ruwaybida. Qila wa ma ruwaybida, qala al-rajla tafi fi amr al-ama. This hadith is reported in Ibn Imajah. It is an authentic hadith. The Prophet sallallahu said, they will come upon the people years of deceit. Years of deceit in which the liar will be believed and the truthful will be considered a liar. The treacherous deceiver will be trusted and the trustworthy custodian will be considered disloyal. And the Ruwaybida will speak out in those times. It was said, who is this Ruwaybida? And he said, the most despicable, worthless person will speak out on behalf of the masses of the people. And Sadaqa Rasulullah, we see it in many of the leadership, not all, but many of the leaders in the world. The most despicable, the most low life person, the one who most of his own people are afraid of, instead of being an outlaw, that person is the head of state. And he speaks out on behalf of people. And some of the leaders, without going into names, but some of the leaders, when they speak, their own people are embarrassed because he's so ignorant. But they can't do anything because he has power. And he will terrorize them. And so the Prophet Sallallahu spoke with this knowledge from above seven heavens. Truthful people will be considered liars. Think about what he said in this hadith. Honest people will be considered disloyal. And it is the liars who will be believed. It is the deceivers who will be given the trust. So this is sanawatun khadda'at. Years of deceit and deception. And this issue of deception is a very important one for the Muslims. And I spent years traveling in the Muslim lands, living with the believers, rubbing shoulders, trying to understand what was happening. And in reality, there is a special form of deception which is striking the Muslim nation. And this is what I want to focus on with you tonight. The general deception is out there. Just turn on BBC or CNN, any of them, and you'll see a professional deceiver who is in front of you. But there's another form of this deception which is striking our community. And we need to be honest and sincere with each other because we have great numbers. We have some of the richest people on the face of the planet Earth. Most of our people are young people. 
We have a great history. We have great armies. Thousands of men standing at arms. But at the same time, there's a, there's a confusion because with this unbelievable wealth, there is poverty. On one occasion, I was called in the African continent where I lived for 10 years to a place in Mali that is called Timbuktu. And for the older generation, Timbuktu is not getting lost in space. Because they used to say, oh, go, go to Timbuktu. Timbuktu was a center of Islamic learning in West Africa. And in the 16th century, the Sankore University had 25,000 students, black African Muslims, 25,000 students in the university studying not only Islamic sciences, but math sciences. And it is said in Timbuktu at that time, every single house had half of the Quran. Every man, woman, and child could speak Arabic along with their native tongue. And so I went there to try to understand what was happening amongst the people. What has come out is that hundreds and thousands of documents were buried in the ground, and they're now coming to the surface, a treasure chest of knowledge. And so I flew to Timbuktu, and the poverty was unbelievable. Sand was everywhere because the desert's coming in. But at the same time, their faith was strong. They were strong believers, hanging on to their faith in those terrible conditions. Then I was asked to go from there to the Emirates. And from one of the poorest places of the world, I then landed in what is now one of the richest places on earth, I couldn't believe the difference in the two. It's the same kalima, it's the same Quran, the same prophet, but yet one is unbelievably poor and one is unbelievably rich. So something is wrong. There's some, something within our deen that we have to deal with as we cry for change. We cry for political change. We want Islamic state. We want Islamic lands. We cry for economic change. Some want Islamic banks. We cry for social change. In some countries, they, they just want halal food because they don't even have halal food. So everybody wants change, but Allah said, Inna Allah la yughayiru ma bi qawmin hatta yughayiru ma bi anfusihim. Allah will not change the condition of a people until they change that which is in themselves. No change. It's on the inside to deal with what we believe about ourselves, our, our concepts, our very idea of being Muslim, what it actually means. We have to repair ourselves before it's too late. And one of the great scholars of Islam, Ibn Qudama al-Maqdasi, rahimahullah, from the area of Syria, he wrote a book, it was Muqtasa min Hajj al-Qasidin. And it was an interesting study because he was looking at certain qualities within us. And he found, he looked at the word taqwa. And you know, we, the Imams use taqwa every Friday it's a very important concept, uh, the consciousness of Allah. But he brought out that taqwa is made up of Arabic word khawf wa raja, that is fear and hope. It's like a combination of the two. You fear Allah, the punishment, but you hope in the mercy of Allah. And what he showed is that uh, he said um, uh, that uh, al khawf he said that uh, fear and hope are stimulants. They stimulate you to do actions. And that which does not lead you or does not stimulate you, it stagnates you, that is deception. That is ghuroa. And this is the term. 
This is the issue we need to look at with detail. And ghuru has many meanings we could say in English. It is not only self-conceit, but it also means illusion. You're living in an illusion. You're deluded. You're deceived. Allah Azza wa Jal told us, وَمَا الْحَيَاةِ الدُّنْيَا إِلَّا مَتَاعُ الْغُرُوَةِ He said the life of this world is nothing but material deception. It's here one day and it's gone. How many of us can remember we were young little children growing up? And then suddenly, snap, time has changed. Life is just flying by us. And as we move toward the day of resurrection, the days are getting shorter. And time is moving faster. And so, uh, Al-Maqtasi, rahimahullah, he looked at this issue of ghuru. And he said, there is a type of ghuru that the masses of the people have. They are deceived by society. And you can see one interesting form of deception is, for instance, the lottery. People put their money down on the lottery and they believe that they can win millions of dollars. And they think that they can get rich by just spending this money. And I remember some time ago uh, in Canada that a family won the lottery and they won something like $20 million. And so they brought the family on television and everybody said, look at this person, look at them. They're in, they're in heaven. Imagine $20 million in your hand. What would you do with $20 million? The father was intelligent. And he said, may God help us. And sure enough, the next day, people were trying to find out where his daughter lived. They wanted their address. They wanted to find them somehow. And so they had to literally change their identity and go underground so the money that was supposed to liberate them put them in prison. dunya illa mata'ul In London, I remember a lottery came and the person won some amazing amount, 25 million pounds, and the British people said, this person is so successful, they're so happy in this world. And so he started, he wanted to enjoy life. So he started to eat food. And he ordered caviar and all types of French foods and whatever. And he ate and he ate and then he drank and he ate. And he continued and continued until he ate so much, he had a heart attack and he dropped dead. So the money that was supposed to give him life took his life. You see the dunya? Wamal hayat dunya. Illa mata'ul ghuroa. The life of this world is nothing but material deception. But there's also some categories amongst the Muslims. And this is where the mind of Ibn Qudama was unbelievable. And sometimes it's like our scholars going from Quran and Sunnah and applying it to their environment. It's almost like sometimes they're talking to us. And he said that if you look at ghuroa amongst the Muslims, there are some people who are deceived by their families. They think that because they come from a good family, that they don't have to do anything. So they say, well, my father was a scholar, so I don't have to study. My mother used to give zakat and sadaqah, so why do I have to give sadaqah? He's being deceived. You will not go to the grave with your parents. It's your actions, but the shaitan will, iyadu billah, got to the mind of that individual. And some people thought that, no, um, my family, we are special people. We come from a lineage. So why do we have to practice Islam? Well, we just be Muslim in name because my family is from a special house and they're like chosen people. That's a deception. And there is a kind of deception, and this is interesting, because some people 
they feel, they look at their deeds. And so they look at their sins and their obedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So they give charity, a certain amount of charity, and, and they feel that because they gave that charity, it'll wash away all of their sins. This is a deception. You have some cases where the person, for instance, goes and he makes Salat al-Fajr in the masjid, and then he gets uh, you know, the, the blessing, 27 times the blessing, and then maybe it was in Ramadan, on, on you know, Laylatul Qadr, and then he starts you know, adding up all of the different numbers until he comes up with hundreds and thousands of hasanat, and so he feels his scale is really high, and so the rest of the day, he spends backbiting people, scandalizing people, raising the prices in his shop. He's being deceived. He's being deceived. So you actually have a person who's doing good, and they are being deceived in such a way that they don't even know it. This is a serious study. Because we have to ask ourselves, I'm just being honest with you, I'm being sincere. This is not a university lecture. I'm talking from the heart, not just from the mind. There has to be some reason why, something in us, why we can't unite with other Muslims. If we pray slightly different than the other person, both may be Sunnah ways of praying. Why is there a negative feeling inside of the heart toward another Muslim? You see? So this is critical for us to deal with. And there is a type of uh, deception that strikes the ulama. And this is interesting because you would think that uh, the scholars are saved from this. No. And Ibn Qadama, rahimahullah, he showed that having knowledge itself is not enough. Because you could be like the Quran says, you would be like a, a donkey with books on his back. The Quran is saying, Qad aflaha men zakaha. The one who is successful is the one who purifies himself. Purifies himself. So the knowledge by itself is not enough. And the Prophet ﷺ said, the time would come when people would read the Quran with beautiful tones, but it would not reach their heart. Think about this. And you have sometimes where this happens. I'll never forget, I lived in a city called Cape Town in South Africa. They have some of the best Qadis in the world. And one time, but the people picked up this habit from Egypt because many of their scholars study in Azhar. And you know, the Egyptians are like soulful people. And we say in America, like when you got soul, like if you look at a, a white Christian church and a black Christian church, the black Christian church is moving and there's soul, right? Egyptians have soul. So when the Qadi reads the Quran, they say, uh, Allah, Allah, Allah. Like they respond. Sometimes they go too far, right? But they respond. And the Qadis will, will read according to uh, if they're talking about paradise or hellfire. And so when, when you listen to their qira'ah, it's like you're living the book itself. And, and one of the beautiful reciters were there. And you know, he was reading and he said, Jahannama yaslonaha wa bit salmi mihad. And he said, you know, and, and, and the person said, Allah, 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 give me some of this. Give me more of this. And this is the way the Egyptians say. And I turned to the brother, I said, do you know what he just said? He said, you go to hell, Jahannam. You want more of that? But he didn't understand. All he was responding to was the beautiful sound. You see, that's how the deception can come. Also, you have amongst the ulama, you will have people who become experts at nahu or sarf, they can tell you the breakdown of the verbs, the breakdown of grammar. They can tell you the authenticity of the hadith, but they don't put it in their own hearts. They don't practice it. But they can break it down. You see, that person is deceived. 
Another person who wears the robes, the clothes of the ulama. And they have everything of that. But yet inside their hearts, they have jealousy, envy. They're doing sneaky things in the back. You see? That's deception. So this is the study of deception. And, and the ulama have to constantly check themselves to make sure of their purity, their humility. And if you look at the Prophet ﷺ, you see the lifestyle that he lived. Look at the great companions, the lifestyles that they lived. Simplicity, humility with each other. If Allah blesses you with knowledge, this is a trust he has given to you. He has not put you on a pedestal over people like the Pope. That's a deception. Another interesting category, and I'm going to be straightforward with you because we have to be sincere. Ibn Qudama, he said, there are people called mutasawwifa. There are people who practice Sufism. And they pretend to be great Sufis. They imitate their dress, their words, their appearance, but actually inside of themselves, they're filled with jealousy. They're filled with pride. Their pride. And that is a form of deception. And I'll take it a step further. There are even people in a movement where they say they are Salafi. And they use the term Salafi, those who came before us and focus on the, 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 uh, the aqidah, making the belief pure. And that is important in Islam. But what happens in some cases is that the person is dealing with book knowledge, dealing with the hadith, but in their own life, they treat people bad, they backbite, they scandalize, they fight each other, they're being deceived. Because if they really were following the Salaf, and that means those who came before us, and all the great Imams, by the way, I'm talking straight Arabic, Imam Malik, Shafi, Hanbali, Hanafi, they're Salafis. Because all it means is those who came before you, the great ulama and scholars who came before you. So if they had a rounded understanding, then humility would touch their heart. If they were really following Sunnah, then they would follow the way of the Prophet ﷺ in how he dealt with other people, in the love that he expressed. And even when Muslims disagree with each other, they would agree to disagree. There's another category of the rich people in Islam. The rich person has money and he spends it on the path of Allah and then he builds a center or something and he said you must have my name must be on it my picture must be on it he wants to do this only for the reputation the person goes to Hajj and he comes back and he says Al Hajj Fulan Fulan and he puts it on his shop because if you're gonna buy food would you buy from a regular shop or you buy from the Hajji shop you see so he made the Hajj, or they, they spend their money to get reputation. That person is being deceived. If they look at the example of Abdurrahman ibn Auf, radiallahu an, Uthman ibn Affan, radiallahu an, many of the companions were wealthy. And they gave in the path of Allah, but they were humble people. Their own personal life was a simple personal life. And they realized that money is with you today but it can be gone tomorrow. And so, deception can hit many people. And it may sound strange, Ibn Qudama even spoke about the case of a person who is mujahid, fi sabilillah. This person is fighting and striving in the path of Allah. But they went to fight in order to get a name. They did not go to fight for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but they wanted the reputation. That person could actually be deceived. Even in something like this where the person is actually dying. But they're dying for the wrong purpose. 
And so Ibn Qudama, rahimahullah, he ended this section by saying that we need to have three things in translations, very high Arabic. And he said, number one, to get out of deception as a Muslim, you need a mind with which a person realizes the reality of things. When you can realize the real reality, in other words, don't spend all your time on that cell phone. Don't listen to the news all the time for your information. The person knows the reality. And the person, taqwa, the consciousness of Allah, they're connected with Allah. Secondly, the person should know, he needs to know oneself, one's Lord, and the worldly life and the hereafter. So to come out of deception, we need to know ourselves. So each person, you need to show what is my strength, what is my weaknesses. Do a self-analysis. Also, understand the life of this world. Many times people will stay in the mosque, they don't know what's going on outside, and the whole world has changed. You have to know what's going on in the world to be able to come out of this deception. But above all, we need to study al-akhirah, the hereafter. Connect ourselves with the hereafter. So we're not just living for this world. And the third point is knowing the way of Allah and how to pass over and deal with obstacles that may hinder one from reaching the goal at the end of it. Okay, so knowing the way of Allah and how to deal with obstacles in the path. There's going to be obstacles in the path. And I want to leave you tonight with the, the, the thoughts of another brilliant scholar. This was a West African scholar whose name was Sheikh Uthman Denfodio Rahimahullah, considered by many as a mujaddid, a renewer of the faith. And he spoke in line with the great scholars who studied the internal Muslim. But what's so interesting about uh, Dan Fodio is that uh, his words, it's like sometimes he's talking to us right now. That's another one of these type of scholars. And he did, in, in one of his books, he was dealing with what is known as Medakhil Iblis. He was dealing with the inroads of the shaitan into the hearts. And we know that the Prophet ﷺ has told us, وَأَنَّ فِي الْجَسَدِ مُدْغَةً إِذَا صَلَحَ الْجَسَدُ كُلُّ وَإِذَا فَسَدَتْ فَسَدَ الْجَسَدُ كُلُّ أَلَا وَهِيَ الْقَلْبِ That inside the body there is a lump of flesh. If it is sound and goes right, everything goes right. But if it is corrupted, everything is corrupted. That's your heart. And the ulama studied what is the entrances of the shaitan into your hearts. There's actually doors to come in. And how do you block these doors? How do you uh, protect yourself from your heart becoming corrupted? Because that is one of the key issues facing our communities and facing the ummah. So from these diseases of the heart, the Sheikh Rahimahullah said, number one, and think about these points, hasad, that is jealousy, envy and jealousy. And that is when you want something, somebody has something that you want. Uh, Zainab has a new baby. Ali pulls up to the mosque with a Lamborghini. Now, how do you feel when he steps out the Lamborghini? If you want one like his, that's okay. That's called ghibta. That's okay. But if you want one, but you hate to see him in that, that's hasad. See the difference in the two? So he said, look at the color of that car. It's ugly. You see, ugly things start coming out your mouth, right? And the baby comes, and they will start to say terrible things about the child. And this is hasad. And the Prophet ﷺ said, Iyakum wal hasad. Beware of jealousy. It will eat up your good deeds like a fire eats up firewood. You go to Hajj, Ramadan, and you're jealous of another person? Burnt up. Jealousy is a serious thing. Number two, 
the fear of poverty. Fear of poverty. This drives people to do strange things because they don't have the tawakkul al Allah. We have to depend upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The fear of poverty can destroy your heart. Number three, keeping more wealth than necessary. This is deep. It's called hoarding your money. So if you have enough wealth to take care of yourself, you know, you, you can live a comfortable life. Nothing wrong with that. You give your zakat. Nothing wrong. But when you start hoarding money and building it up and building it up, that's when the shaitan will come inside your heart. This is practical information we're getting now. Number four, holding suspicion against Muslims. This is deep. You suspect another Muslim. And so you see that Muslim coming. I know many times I will come walking along and they say, uh, Salaam Alaikum brother, which country do you come from? They're trying to figure me out, right? Because if I'm an Arab or if I'm a Pakistani or if I'm Turk, they're going to judge you, right? And I was living in Medina for many years and alhamdulillah, I lived there for six years and back in the old days, you know, in the 70s, right? And so we used to put hujaj in our house and stuff like that in those days. So I would go amongst the crowd and I would find um, Muslims dressed like uniforms. They, Pakistani has a kurta and a certain cap. Egyptian got his jalabiya. You know, we wear our clothes almost like a uniform. And then they would see somebody coming along the road and he has a Nigerian hat, a Moroccan top, Pakistani pants, and Sudani shoes. So they say, they say, that's an American. They might say, that's a Trinidadian too, right? That's somebody from the West. And that's a good thing, because you're taking the best of all the cultures. But when the person judges you before they know you, that's suwadhan, suspicion. And we sometimes suspect other Muslims. This is a major mistake. Number five, and this is a deep one. You know, back in the 18th century in West Africa, they had a book done by a scholar named Sanusi, Aqidah to Suhra, it was called, the small form of Aqidah. And so some of the students of knowledge would get this book on Aqidah, and they would go and start testing the Imams, testing all the different people. And they, the person's a, a simple Muslim, and they say, where is Allah? Like they start asking you questions that scholars are supposed to know. And so the sheikh said, this is an entrance of the shaitan into hearts. That these questions on philosophy and aqidah, this is for those who are educated. The masses of the Muslims, they love Allah, they love the messenger. Teach that person. If that doesn't per person doesn't know the details, teach that person. But don't condemn that person. So this is an entrance into the hearts. Number six, obstinacy and supporting one's own opinion. Stubbornness, my way or the highway. Some people say, if you don't follow my school of thought, I'm not going to pray behind you. I've heard Muslims say that. I can't pray behind a Hanafi. One person came and, and, and you know, they, he said, Brother Abdullah, um, uh, can a Hanafi marry a Shafi? These schools of thought in Islam, Sunnah, right? And I said, what are we, Jehovah's Witnesses and Catholics? The Imams were students and teachers of each other. One of the great Imams, Imam Malik, Rahimahullah, the Imam of Dar al-Hijrah, on one occasion, a group came from Mecca and they said, there's a student amongst us. The Amir of Mecca wants you to take him as a student. Imam Malik said, go back. He doesn't listen to the political people. And they said, please, Imam. He said, bring the boy. And so they brought the boy and he looked at him, he tested him, and he said, put him in my halaqa. You know who that boy was? It was Imam Shafi. You see? You know Maliki school and Shafi school? Shafi was the best student of Imam Malik. 
students and teachers of each other. On one occasion, Imam al-Shafi, he went to Iraq, and he prayed in the masjid of Imam Abu Hanifa. And you know, the Shafis, many of them, they will make uh, dua kunut in fajr. Right? That's one of the things that Imam al-Shafi put in his school of thought. And so they came, and it was fajr time, and Imam al-Shafi was there. Imam Abu Hanifa had passed away. And he led the salat, no dua kunut. So they said, Imam, why didn't you read dua kunut? He said, because I respect the opinion of Imam Abu Hanifa. See how they were with each other? And stubbornness is, is one of the uh, big problems. If you disagree with somebody, that's still your brother or your sister. Agree to disagree. But we're still part of the same ummah. That's what ummah consciousness is like. Being able to support each other and love each other and make dua for each other. Even though there's differences amongst us. We're coming to a point where there are people who want to destroy Islam completely. I'm telling you. And they're spending billions of dollars to do this. The next point, number seven, is anger and uncontrolled emotions. al ghadab And one time a person came to the Prophet ﷺ and said, give me some advice. He said, la taqadab. Don't get angry. Your emotions. You know when our emotions take us. And so we have an argument. They say, I don't want to see this person anymore. One brother, he said, I'm finished with his aid. I don't even want to go to his janaza. So what is this, man? Just because you argued with somebody, you won't even attend his janaza. This is an inroad of the evil one into our hearts. Number eight, greed and ambition. Too much ambition. We want to be the leader. I want to be the emir. I want to be on top. Too much ambition. Be humble. Be simple. Power is with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And leadership is responsibility. It's amana. It's a trust that's on us. It's not sulta. It's not power over people like their slaves. Number nine, and this is an interesting one. He said, haste, doing things too quickly except when necessary. And the Prophet ﷺ said in the hadith, Al-Ajala min ash-shaytan. He said, haste is from the devil. You make a decision. The sister came to me and she said, I want to marry this brother. He just came Middle Eastern brother and he speaks Arabic so nicely and he brought all the hadiths and he said, you know, you know, you have to get married, whatever. I see, I really love the brother and he wants to go to Niagara Falls. You know in Canada we have Niagara Falls? When people get married, they go there, right, to the falls. And I said, do you know this brother's family? Have you checked him out? Have you done kafa'a, suitability? No, no, we're in love. So there's no just in love. You have to check him out. And this is a real story. And eventually the sister came in the office and she had a, a, a black eye. We said, what is this? Her husband had beat her. And then she came again and, and, and crying and everything. So I went with her family member and we went to the house and we found him. And we said, what is this? He said, she's my wife. I own her. I can do what I want to do. And we said, no, that's not what you're going to do here. And eventually, she came, but then she, was, she had a soft heart. She said, oh, but I love him. I need to stay with him. So we put some fear in, 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 the, in the man's heart. And she stayed. A month later, she, they came, the police came. And they found that this person was driving her car. Driving her car. He never paid for anything. She worked and paid for all the food, everything. And he got into an accident and he killed somebody in the accident and he ran and he went to the airport and flew to the Middle East. This was a real story. And we found out later on when we checked out 
called somebody in the place where he was from. He had another wife in his own country. So you're in love. Don't be too hasty. Check him out. Haste, as we used to say, makes waste. And number 10, and this is an interesting point. Sheikh Uthman Rahimullah, he said, one of the inroads of the shaitan to our heart is excessive love of food and drink. If you love food, you don't eat to live, but you love to eat. You just love the food. You love the drink. That's your desires, right? So if your desires overtake you, then the evil one can come into your life. And so we are at a crossroads and we need to look into ourselves. On one road of the fork of the road, there is destruction. Another one, there is salvation with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If we look into ourselves, make a change within us, and remember that Allah said, Inna Allah la yughayiru ma bi qawmin, hatta yughayiru ma bi anfusihim. Allah will not change the condition of a people until they change that which is in themselves. May Allah Azza wa Jal help us to change our hearts and to unite us. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala have mercy upon the children of the Ummah of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa May Allah have mercy and protect the dignity of the women of the Ummah of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa May Allah raise up true men in the Ummah of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa May Allah raise up true leadership in our countries to take us from darkness into light. And may Allah give us as our last word, our best words. Kalima la ilaha illallah. Muhammad Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. I say what I have said. Aqulu qawli hadha wa astaghfirullahi wa lakum. Wassalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.